And, of course, the king of Israel wanted to smite them. He said, no, you're not going to smite them. He said, you don't smite prisoners that you, kept, that you captured in battle. These are my prisoners. Feed them and let them go. And then the Bible said the Syrians came no more against the king of Israel. I don't think I'd be wanting to fight against him any either. But, but the point I'm making is it requires faith. And Elisha was a man of faith. Do you remember the New Testament, Romans 8, verse 31, where Paul said, And what shall we say to these things? Help me out. If God be for us, who can be against us? You see, God's people are to be a people of faith. Now, let me go a little bit further in Deuteronomy chapter 20. I've given you four things. First of all, fightings and wars are an assumed fact in Scripture. Secondly, numerical odds are inconsequential to the people of faith. Thirdly, superior armaments or weaponry means absolutely nothing. That is also inconsequential to the people of faith. And then the major difference or the stated advantage is we have the sovereign God of heaven and earth on our sides. Now, in the Bible, when the Israelite militia was mustered, all males from 20 years old and upward presented themselves. However, not all of them went to war. In fact, in some cases, like Numbers chapter 31, only a 1,000 from each tribe went to war. There were only 12,000 that went to war at that particular time. But in all cases, there were exclusions, there were exemptions from military service. Why were there these exclusions? Why were there these exemptions? And the Bible says, and I'll look at it, with you in just a moment, but in verse 5, in verse 6, and verse 7, these exclusions were, lest he die. Now, that brings me to a very important point. And I want you to understand that men die in battle. Even righteous men die in battle. Even when they're fighting for a righteous cause. It is true that God generally and sovereignly protects His own in battle. If you study the Bible, and I don't have time to go over this with you, but before every battle, the soldiers gave a shekel, that is an atonement money or a half shekel, to the sanctuary. And that atonement money was for his life in case he died in battle. Uh, But God does sovereignly protect His people. For instance, in Numbers chapter 31... There were 12,000 Israelite soldiers that went into battle against the cities of Midian. Do you realize that during these battles, these 12,000 soldiers slew all the men of Midian. They brought back 675,500 sheep, 72,000 cattle, 61,000 asses, and 32,000 unmarried women, all without the loss of one soldier. Not one Israelite died in those battles in Numbers chapter 31. God is indeed able to protect His own. And God is able to protect His own at all times. But there are some times God sovereignly allows righteous men to die in battle, even when they're fighting for a righteous cause. You say, why? Well, the answer is really very simple. I could point it out like this. Do you realize it is God's will to heal most of the time? And I can prove that very simply. Because everyone in this room has been sick and has gotten well. But it's not God's will to heal all of the time, because if He healed all the time, no one would ever die. And what's the Bible say? The wages of sin are death. Now, this is true in reference to war as well. We must remember that death is a part of life. Everyone in this room, if our Lord tarries, is going to die. That is a simple fact. Death is a part of life. You cannot die without having lived. God has not only ordained the end, He's also ordained the means to that end. In Job 7 and verse 1, the Word of God says, Is there not an appointed time for man upon earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hireling? Do you realize the very days of our lives are numbered? 
Listen to what the Word of God says in Job 14, verse 5, talking about man. Seeing his days are numbered, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. We're not going to live one minute or one second past the time that God has ordained that we die. David said it like this in Psalm 31 and verse 15. He said, My times are in thy hands. In Psalm 66 and verse 9, he said it like this, He, God, holdeth our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. So the reality is that sometimes righteous men do die in battle even when they are fighting for a righteous cause. Look at Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson, one of the most godly men that ever lived, and yet he was killed in battle by his own men, but still he was killed in battle. Look at Uriah. Uriah the Hittite. Uriah was a godly man. Joab was a murderer. And yet Uriah died and Joab did not die in battle. So the truth is, warfare is not child's play. It is grim, gruesome, and ugly. But it's necessary from time to time. And in war, many people die. And we've got to remember that according to the Word of God, war is waged upon the wicked who are already under the judicial sentence of death from God. Thus, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, He put the sword in their hand and instructed them to slay every one of those Canaanites. Rush Dooney, in his book, Institutes of Biblical Law, said this. He said, If warfare is to punish or to destroy evil, The work of restoration requires that this be done, that an evil order be overthrown, and in some cases, some or many people executed. So the point is, when you start punishing evil, when you start exercising biblical justice, men die, and oftentimes not just the wicked, sometimes the righteous as well. Thus, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, God gives us some exemptions Here are some men that although they were able to fight, qualified to fight, God said they shall not fight. Now, who does God exempt from military service? Well, look down in verse 5. The very first one that exempted is one who has built a house and not dedicated it. And the officer shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man Dedicate it. Now, when we talk about a house dedication, many of us think of some little ceremony that we go through today. I've dedicated houses. I've had people build houses that are Christians, and they would say, Pastor, come and offer a prayer, read some Scripture. We want to give this house to the Lord. We want to use it for Him, and we want our doors to be open to all of God's people. And I certainly do that. And, and usually that little... Uh, ceremony takes about 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever. It doesn't take long. That's normally what we think about, but that is the furthest thing from the truth when the Bible is here speaking about dedicating a house. The word dedicate is the word kanak in the Hebrew, and it literally means to narrow or to discipline or to train or to dedicate or to initiate. The root word is the word hanak, and it is translated as trained servants in Genesis 14 and verse 14. You remember Abraham had his 318 trained servants or 318 dedicated servants? Also in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 5 and 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 63, this same word is used of of the priest or the Levites being trained in offering the sacrifices unto God. Now, let me give you the same word in another passage that you're going to understand. Proverbs 22, verse 6, what's the Bible say? Train up a child in the way that he should go. Literally, dedicate the child in the way that he should go. And the word train there means to initiate or to discipline. Uh, You remember the Jews have a feast called uh, Hanukkah. And that is basically from that same word, Hanak. And it was a celebration of the restoration of the temple in 165 after they got rid of Antichius Epiphanes. And the dedication of this house then is not just some little ceremony, but what the dedication of the house is, 
is the training and the discipline of that house. So here the young husband then had to be exempt from service in order that he might train his wife and discipline his children and train them as well. Now, note if you would please in verse 5. And the officer shall speak unto the house, uh, to the people, saying, What man is there that hath built a new house? Note, the house is already built. He's already living in it. 